Good morning uh, to all and welcome to this virtual conference titled Moving Cities, Progressive Solidarity Cities Welcoming Migrants and Refugees in Europe. My name is Alia Fakri. Uh, I'm a migration researcher with the German Council on Foreign Relations, and I'm pleased to be your moderator for today's event. This conference is brought to you by the partners of the Moving Cities Project, which are the political movement Seebrücke and the German political foundations Heinrich Böll Stiftung and Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung. It is supported by the Stiftungsfonds Zivile Zehnotretung and the Robert Bosch Stiftung. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping notes for you. Uh, we have interpreters working with us today, so you can follow this event in English, in Greek or in German. To use the interpretation, you can find a little globe icon at the bottom right of your screen right now, and you can choose the, the language you'd like to listen to. Um, I'd like to use this note to remind our speaker to use a moderate pace when they will be speaking today uh, to ease the work of the interpreters. Um, if you have a technical issue during this event, you can contact our IT team using the chat function and you can write to them in English or in Greek. Um, I'd also like to let you know that this event is being recorded. So um, today's event is all about how cities do migration policy in Europe. Uh, and we will hear from a broad uh, spectrum of actors, including civil society actors, uh, people from the research world, but also from municipalities themselves. We will start with opening remarks from representatives of the three partner organizations of the Moving Cities Project. Uh, and we will then move to a first panel that will give us some context for our discussions today. Uh, in the second panel, uh, we will focus on the launch of the Moving Cities website and we will hear from some of the people that stand behind the website. And this afternoon, we will have two interactive workshops uh, looking at the role of municipalities and the role of the civil society uh, in parallel. There will be opportunities for you to interact and to participate throughout the event. So thanks again for joining us, for making time to being with us today. Uh, and without further ado, I will turn to our opening speakers uh, who will kick us off for today's discussion. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we are pleased to be joined by Dr. Hélène Übescher, who is the chairperson of the Heinrich Böll Stiftung, uh, Daniela Trokowski, chairperson of the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, and Lisa Pflaum, who is co-founder of the Zebruke movement. Uh, I will go around the room in this order. So, uh, Hélène Übescher, would you like to start with your opening remarks? Thank you, Alia, for this introduction. I'm very happy to see this introduction today and that we have this platform, uh, Moving Cities, and we can present it to you. We know that the topic of migration is, uh, and integration is one of the most complicated chapters of the European Union, and lots of abuse is also done in the European landscape. On the other hand, we also work here, and I think that believes that that's true for everybody here involved. We're trying to change the narrative away from migration as a threat. Uh, away from that, no, migration is uh, actually a richness. Uh, it is normality and it is a necessity of uh, humankind. On the one hand, we have to provide people with asylum. And on the other hand, we also have to integrate people as best possible. And uh, in this sense, we have got together here, although we can see that uh, the willingness to act and the capabilities to act of the European Union has been uh, shown up uh, all the more recently. We see the crisis at the borders of Poland and uh, Belarus, but we also know that the human rights situation in Croatia, which at last has uh, become public, uh, is uh, inhumane that this is uh, not uh, based on uh, European values at the European external borders. We can see violations of human rights, illegal pushbacks at the external borders, and we cannot tolerate that. And uh, what we hear from the European capitals about uh, integrating people from Afghanistan, that is also something very shameful, another problem. And at the same time, it's not enough to say 
this is just one difficult political area with, where we can't do very much now. On the contrary, we can see players, people involved at the municipality levels, having ideas at this level of cities. They go further, they integrate people, they welcome them. And uh, in this context, moving cities, which is what we are launching today and uh, showing it to the public, is now um, accentuating something very important. It shows up that European municipalities are um, have show uh, solidarity with each other, but also with migrants coming to Europe, either for a longer time or for a shorter period of time, and they protect them and help feed them. And uh, they also show that solidarity and learning from each other is possible. We are very, very glad to have this uh, local authorities level. We, as the Heinrich Böll Stiftung, have been trying for quite some time to try to find out uh, whether it's possible to cooperate directly from a European level with the cities and the municipalities and to make it possible to use and tap on this potential for willingness to uh, accept people and not stop this process or hinder it because Europe massively needs this. If you're interested in this, uh, with Petra Bendel, we have issued recommendations for a key role of municipalities, and I can only recommend you to read them. But we can see this mapping today. We can see that uh, municipalities are very willing to welcome people, creative uh, approaches, especially in Southern Europe, where the pro problem is so much greater than in Germany or other more northern countries. We have Tilos in Greece, uh, uh, Barcelona in Spain, uh, Bologna, Madrid, Naples, Palermo in Italy. They are all cities uh, being creative, uh, very committed uh, with all sorts of societal initiatives towards integration and living together in the society in cohesiveness. And this uh, web launch is a beginning of course, not everything has been done, that's clear. Not all countries have been included in the mapping. And uh, what I find particularly important also as a signal, a message of solidarity of European cohesion is the fact that uh, municipalities from countries who in Brussels in the European uh, Council uh, have a blockade uh, attitude are in this project, like Danzig, for example, in Poland. Uh, Danzig understands itself as a welcoming city. And maybe we should also add here that the uh, Danzig, that the mayor who started with this, Gdansk, as a welcoming city, he had to pay for this with his life. That is also part of the truth of this story. And uh, Europe as a whole is work in progress. And I believe that uh, if uh, we want to learn from each other using this website at a level of the municipalities and cities, then that will have an impact on the other political levels, either at national or European level. So I believe that this learning from each other and uh, having new ideas, initiatives, exchange of uh, experiences and meeting, and then bringing all this to Brussels, that is a very good way, path towards European political um, new positioning. And since this is a phase we are in now, I am very happy that we have this launch today. And uh, in conclusion, of course, I would like to thank Seebrücke, Lisa Pflaum, of course, especially, Alice Fritz, uh, who had the idea and conceived of this, uh, uh, Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, Daniela Trochowski, and everybody else, uh, all cooperation partners. I would like to thank them all for our trustful cooperation, and of course, also Christine Pütz, Claudia Rote, and our team here in Heinrich Böll Stiftung, who accompanied the launch of this website so well. And uh, I'm also glad to mention Nida Korayek here, and I'd like to say special thanks to her for the fact that uh, she, with Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung in Athens, has uh, been uh, preparing this event so well today. So off we go into a new political era. Thank you. Introduces quite nicely the other speakers uh, for our um, introduction panel. 
So I will just turn to Daniela Trukowski uh, if you'd like to um, continue and uh, give us your opening remarks. Thank you. Good morning also on my behalf and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to say a few words of welcome. We already heard that uh, Ms. Überscher said this is a very interesting event. We have many actors, many people who are involved in this project that push each other and boost each other. And that's why we hope that in the years to come, we this website can also uh, be promoted. So this event takes place, and I have to say it again, at the really right time, because in these days, once again, Europe is discussing migration or actually discussing about hindering migration. And uh, a Minister of Interior tries to push back refugees at the Polish border in order to limit migration and also to keep away refugees from Europe. And these uh, images we saw from the external borders of the European Union show us that refugees cannot really rely on international law and that they need support, that they need support from organizations and people who want to change the situation. We also know that they, these people are quite a lot here and very active in Germany. They want to support people. In 2015, we've experienced that within very few hours, we had lunch packs, we had solidarity movements. And during the movement Inseparable, we were so many people demonstrating on the streets. And uh, in Warsaw, we could also see last weekend what is going on and our Polish neighbors uh, in Warsaw and in Krakow uh, discussed or um, protested against the pushbacks. And this shows how committed they were. I think after so many years, they can say, we can say that we are a lot and we are everywhere. And this is important to know. And for several years, we've been saying, we also see mayors and also actors of the civil society and also representatives of municipalities say that there is enough space for them. So whether we hear from Tilos, the small island in Greece, or uh, we hear from other cities throughout Europe, there are people everywhere who are willing to support, willing to help and willing to show their solidarity. And this is so much stronger this will is so much stronger than with politician. The platform Moving Cities that is going to be launched today shows where the commitment is throughout Europe, where people can find support, where, can, where inclusion takes place. And the platform will have seven, will be available in seven languages. And we are, want to inspire more actors to also use our ideas and to implement it in their context, in their municipality. And being able to make it possible is something that we really wanted to work for. And that's why it is so important that this website is going to be launched. The Rosa Luxemburg Foundation is, and this is, by the way, the connection between the local and the social movements. 
And this is also something that you see that city policy becomes more and more democratic because people can change something, can make a difference. And what is also important is to find places for implementation. And these rights are very often discussed in a very abstract way. And I think we um, are all grateful for Lisa Flaum and the movement Seebrücke who initiated this idea. We all set a very strong signal for solidarity among each other, but also for people who migrate to Europe. And this is a solidarity that goes beyond the national borders and considering uh, the rise of the right wing movements, I think this is particularly important. And that's why we would like to ask you to share and distribute the website because a website can only survive if it's well known and also really market the website so that we can show that we are many people and that a different migration policy in Europe and in Germany is possible. And I think with so many committed people, we can also say what I've said before, we are many, but we have to become more and more. And that's why the website can also contribute to this. I would also like to thank the Heinrich Böll Foundation for this uh, cooperation. And of course, also uh, thank our colleagues who supported this project and who are going to support this project in the months and years to come. And of course, everyone who is going to introduce their projects today and also everyone who is committed in this context. I have met many people since 2015 and they just started from scratch because they just wanted to help people. They wanted to show their solidarity. They didn't discuss for too long. They just put everything into action and bringing all these people together, organizing them. I think this is a very important task for us as a political foundation. And of course, we uh, we will continue to contribute working on this. Thank you very much. And I wish everyone a fruitful discussion and also mutual connections. And bottom-up approaches, I think this brings us nicely to our third speaker, Lisa Flaum. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you also on my behalf. I'm very pleased to welcome you all here for the launch of moving cities this is a long overdue project we do need a place where all the initiatives need to be visible on one in one place and this is something that we managed to make possible we want to show that a different migration policy is not just possible but is also already a reality with our project, we focus right from the beginning on the local level, because we could see that on a European level, it's not just nothing happening. Um, furthermore, there is even blockage and pushbacks. And instead of protecting people, uh, protecting refugees, they are not supported. So. And that's why fleeing from a country is more and more dangerous and complicated. And so many people has, have lost their lives while fleeing from their countries. We can also say that many people seeking refuge, refuge in different countries are stuck in, on Greek islands, on different Libyan uh, camps and also at the border from of Poland. So the situation doesn't improve. Uh, it's the opposite is the case. And we also see that this 
European policy is something that is done deliberately and is something that wants to set a, a clear signal. And the signal is don't try to come to the European Union because you will end up in horrible camps. But what we also see for two years now, or even longer, that on a local level, there's a counter movement, a movement that starts from the civil society that want to make sure that uh, people are protected. They want to welcome people. And civil society created this. They want to create alternative solutions and we can also say that the municipalities just go beyond their initial tasks. So what we see is that for at least one and a half years now, we see in Germany, but also throughout Europe, that there are municipalities uh, who say we are responsible and we want to go beyond our local responsibility. We want to protect human rights, the human rights of people who are already in our municipality, but also who are about to come to our municipality. And we can say that migrational policy plays an essential role also within the municipalities. And we can also say that the access to housing integration or access to education, pa participation, so all this takes place on a municipal level and that's why we think that we from Seebrücke think this is the easiest way to make it possible and that's why we ask for more participation when the discussions are about participation and integration in society. And that's exactly what we want to show today with moving cities. The municipalities have recognize that it's easier to become active. They want to create projects. They want to find out how to organize housing. They want to avoid bringing people to camps. And we want to show that we have several European cities being open for solidarity and want to welcome refugees. There are more and more people who develop their own paths, they start their own networks and they want to welcome them. Since 2018, we have at least 250 cities declaring themselves as a safe haven. And that's um, what we can say has proven being a very positive result or showing a positive result. All over Europe, we can see that mayors, different cities and people living in different cities, they want to show and express their solidarity because they see that the European Union cannot do anything or is too slow and very often it is not possible to just locate people in a very distant place we can see what is possible in different municipalities and we see that people are willing to welcome refugees there is enough space there is enough space for everyone and this is exactly the future of a sol um, of a movement or a solidarity movement for integration and for refugees. I think we can see new approaches and a different policy is possible. We don't just need to think on a national level or a European level that makes things complicated and wants to avoid that people flee from their countries. What we want to see is what exists already and what works well. So with our platform, we can say clearly there is an alternative and I'm really pleased that we can introduce these alternatives. And of course, I do hope that there will be more and more initiatives to join our movement. And I'm very pleased to see you all here. And I would also like 
to thank Alice Fritze. Without her, this project wouldn't have been possible. And I would also like to thank und Claudia Rote, Stefanie Krohn, Wenke Christoph und Kar Caroline Hügli. Vielen, vielen Dank. Ich freue mich sehr, dieses spannende Projekt heute ähm, vorzustellen und mit Ihnen weiter in die Diskussion zu kommen. Thank you very much, uh, Lisa Flam, and thank you very much to the three of you for uh, setting the scene for, uh, for today. I think you were uh, pointing to some somehow opposing, uh, opposing tendencies that we see in Europe. Uh, where we have perhaps a lack of capacity or a lack of will to act at our uh, national levels and our borders especially and precisely in these regions in Eastern Europe and Southern Europe we see cities uh, and uh, civil organizations taking the lead with uh, innovative uh, practices uh, and that give a, a concrete illustration to the concept of access to rights uh, for for all. Um, I think you also started pointing to some of the solutions that we uh, might discuss today, which, uh, for instance, uh, point to bottom up and civil initiatives and the resonance they can have at the political level, uh, but also to uh, the role that uh, the European Union could play in uh, giving access to, uh, to funds to municipalities. So I think you're already uh, 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 brushing a bit of a um, uh, the landscape of the different actors that we're going to be speaking today. And speaking of actors, uh, we would like to uh, actually turn to our audience now and ask them um, who is um, behind the screen today with us. Uh, we'd like to uh, get to know you a little bit better. Um, so there will be a link to a poll that will be posted now in uh, the chat. Uh, you can follow this link and uh, which is right now in the, in the chat box, and uh, you will be uh, linked to a, a survey that will ask you which organization or which grouping of organization you're joining us from. Uh, are you working with a local government, a local administration? Are you working with a, or active with a civil society organization that is active at the local level? or civil society that is active at the national or transnational level or the academia? Um, we also have uh, perhaps people from the media sphere uh, with us today. So yeah, we're going to wait a few seconds so that we have some, uh, somewhat of a stable, uh, a stable graph. Uh, but it seems that we have a lot of people from the civil society world and I guess uh, more transnational uh, or national uh, types of organizations. Uh, quite a few people from the local administration as well, a lot of people from academia and a lot of others. So uh, we hope to get to know them as well today. Um, so uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, taking the poll. And I think with that, uh, we are ready to start our discussions with our first panel, uh, which uh, precisely represents this wide broad of this wide range of, of actors that we also have in the room. So thank you very much for uh, joining us. Um, this panel is about uh, why does the local level matter? And uh, I'm sure we'll have some very interesting responses from all the, the speakers today. I will start by introducing them. Uh, we will then have a first round of discussions together and uh, we will then open to questions in the chat. Uh, so you can use the Q&A function to already post your questions to our speakers. So I'm pleased to be joined by, uh, I'll start with uh, Professor Barbara Omen, who is a professor in the sociology of human rights at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. She leads a European wide uh, research program called Cities of Refuge uh, that looks at the relevance of human rights in the way that local authorities welcome and integrate refugees. Uh, you can find some of her many publications on the website citiesofrefuge.eu, um, as well as a highly recommendable uh, podcast series. Uh, thank you for being with us. Um, next, I'm pleased to welcome uh, Tarek Alaus, uh, who is uh, an expert on migration and refugee uh, policy, and he's also active with a number of civil society uh, initiatives like Sebuke, among others. Um, third is uh, Mireille Alphonse, who is a green member of the City Council of Montreuil, which is a city near Paris. 
This is her second mandate as a city councillor, and her current missions relate to food supply issues. Uh, so that includes making organic food available to vulnerable populations. Uh, often including uh, populations and with, with migrant populations. Uh, we will uh, later be joined by Katja Donner, uh, who actually should join us uh, very soon, uh, who's the mayor of the city of Bonn in Germany, and I will introduce her uh, right when she uh, she enters the room. Um, so I'd like to start with uh, you, Barbara. Um, you have done um, extensive research on how cities in Europe deal with uh, migration issues and how they, they do migration policy at their level. Can you give us an idea of uh, what the role, what is the role of European cities in migration policy uh, today? Well, yes, thank you very much, Alia, and my compliments to the whole Moving Cities team. I think this is really a wonderful moment, the launch of the of, of, of the website and all the information on it. And indeed, I'm so excited also because this is a topic very much close to my heart and that of the research team with which we're working. Um, concerning migration in Europe, uh, Virginie Giraudon once said, ever since 2015, we've seen migration governance move up and down and out and the up is of course to the european level the out initially was also very much about the privatization of migration governance but i think now can also denote what happens at the borders we've already heard about belarus we've heard about what happens um, at the border of poland but also uh, refugee governance and migration governance moving down and as already has been said this moving down this moving to the local level i think is where a lot of hope and promise and alternatives are so let me use these moments to just briefly say something about which local authorities in europe one sees going the extra mile where it concerns migration governance also what they do and how they go about it. In terms of the which, of course, this uh, session is called movies, Moving Cities, but I think you could have also spoken about moving villages or moving hamlets because it's big cities, but it's also local authorities. It's also small um, villages. Uh, Tilos was already named that go the extra mile where it concerns migration governance. Um, it's far from all cities. This is why I think it's so important to show the mass of it if you look at it at a European scale. Um, but it's cities all throughout Europe, as said, also in Eastern Europe, in Southern Europe, in Northern Europe. Uh, big local authorities, small local authorities going the extra mile. What they do very much also depends on the mandate. Uh, for instance, in, in Turkey, we also do a lot of research in Turkey and there um, local authorities have no formal mandate where it concerns integration and yet end up doing very much. And there's other more decentralized countries such as Spain, but also Switzerland, where local authorities have much more room and official um, function also where it concerns migration. So what if we speak about local authorities really going the extra mile, what, what, what do they do? Well, I think um, if you look at the migration pathway, um, local authorities engage in all moments and all dimensions. So for instance, in 2015, we've see, we saw a lot of going the extra mile in terms of welcoming. We already heard about the food packages, but what you see more and more, and I think Seybrook is an excellent example of that, is also people in a given local authority in Europe really caring about what happens on the Greek islands, uh, on the Italian islands, and creating humanitarian corridors to take responsibility where the government does not. So in terms of reception, um, you see extra activity there. The bulk, I think, of the work is done where it concerns integration. So the classic means and markers of integration are housing, 
education, work, and in all these fields, you see that local authorities often have competences, and even where they don't, they creatively try to um, create policies, projects that enable faster, more successful integration. Now, a third dimension that I think we should also speak about concerns um, those people who do not have the right to stay in the European Union, um, the, the forced migrants, um, the irregular residents, because we all know that often people do not have the right to stay at the same time they cannot go back, their government, their country doesn't take them back. And then what happens then to undocumented migrants? And there you also see local authorities um, on the basis of human rights really taking responsibility well briefly how do they uh, how do they do this uh, it strikes us looking all over Europe over and over again uh, the role of individual leadership mayors councillors taking the lead but also of networks which we call city society because what you see often at the local level is really civil society and government actors uh, walking shoulder to shoulder on these, uh, these matters. International networks really make the difference as well. Um, also networks started up with European funding where it is really important to at some point institutionalize policies and also to mainstream them. Well, this just as a very brief introduction into which local authorities, what they do, how they go about it. I suppose I could also say a lot about the why this is and why it's important, but that might be for a next round. Um, for now, let me say that also in understanding what we see all over Europe and in strengthening it, I think this um, map is a really important step. So again, my uh, compliments on all those who made it happen. Thank you very much, uh, Barbara, for your, uh, for your words. I think you, uh, you gave us already quite a, a tour d'horizon of what we're going to be um, talking about today. I see that uh, Katja Derner is with us in the room. Uh, so being mindful of time, I'd like to turn to her. Um, Katja is um, mayor of Bonn since uh, November 2020. Uh, before that, between 2019 and 2020, she was a member of the German parliament. And as of 2014, uh, she served as deputy chair of the Green Parliamentary Group uh, and as a member of the Committee for Family Affairs, Senior Citizens, Women and Youth. Um, so I believe, Katja, you will be able to uh, give us an idea of um, how the practices and the initiatives that Barbara just described fit into your local policy and the way that you envisage your work with uh, migrant populations, foreign population, refugee groups, and perhaps also undocumented uh, groups, if you have a chance. Um, anyways, we look forward to hearing about the experience of Bonn with uh, the question of migration. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. I hope uh, you don't mind if I do my uh, comments in German. Uh, I was informed that there are translators. Okay, then I do it in German. Uh, vielen Dank uh, für die Einladung. Und ich Thank you very much for inviting me. I think it's a great to have an event about this topic and in general i think that the entire question about migration and integration should be uh, discussed more so thank you very much um, heinrich Böll foundation for making this possible considering bonn i would like to say that for decades we've been the capital of germany and we are already uh, international, also from a, a traditional point of view, and um, yeah, we still continue being international. We have the typical work uh, migrant migration at the end of the 1950s, and since the 1980s, we had s several uh, 
refugees and welcomed several refugees, but also, of course, in 2015 and experienced migration. Today, the situation is as follows. We have uh, 100,000 people in Bonn with a migration background, and this is one third of the entire population of the city of Bonn. So this is just to give you an insight or an overview of how the situation in Bonn is. The majority uh, come from Syria and uh, also from Turkey. So all these generations of people migrating to Bonn and also refugees show us how long it took until integration is seen as a permanent task. And the reason why this happened was mainly or coming from cities. And this is something we notice during the discussion about Afghanistan. I can say a few words about this in a minute. But I think it also is connected to the fact that people live in cities, learn in cities, and work with others together. And that's why cities play an important role. And that's why migration and work with refugees is so important. In 2018, we started uh, a special um, office in our or kind of um, department in Bonn in order to tackle integration and in, also, in order to keep all the tasks together. So what um, this department does is network, start with projects and also concepts, initiate concepts, but also support supports a concepts and projects that uh, are developed by migrants. And this structure uh, has proven to be a very useful structure because in 2015, we could see that within the municipality, it is really important to have a joint approach in order to bring everyone together so that the different authorities can um, adjust their programs. And this is something that worked very well in Bonn. And that's also something that we can see in the current situation. So I, as a mayor of Bonn, I notice that when we discuss uh, welcoming a refugee beyond the principles, we have many supporters in Bonn, and this happened way more often than in other cities. So the support is enormous within the civil society and for me as a mayor this is very positive and very important we are um, a member of the network safe haven and uh, we also want to be active in this network we also showed our willingness to welcome people from refugee camps or from countries they had to flee to welcome them and uh, when the situation in uh, afghanistan deteriorated i was the first one to say that we are of course willing to show our contribution and to welcome people from afghanistan and currently we have a really nice uh, project it's from women in the city council, beyond party groups, they decided to submit a project and also to welcome women in this context, uh, to offer school classes and uh, different parts, uh, different actions for children. And together with the city of Cologne, we uh, welcomed uh, more than 200 people from Afghanistan. And when we say welcome, it means, of course, housing, also 
uh, kindergarten, schools, etc. And of course, this is a challenge. And this might be my closing remark. We are very open as a city of Bonn. We still have, of course, many problems with housing and affordable housing. We have also um, problems with kindergarten, enough space in the kindergartens. Um, but we don't stop here. We are open for this and we, of course, need the support from outside and from other uh, levels, also from the federal government, of course. And I would uh, ask, of course, for more support than we had so far. So that was it on my behalf. Um, I think you uh, illustrated quite well the notion that uh, Barbara just mentioned of city society and how the different actors at different levels come together um, in a space, in a city, uh, may it be the municipality, uh, may it be uh, the, the, the general public, uh, or may it be the, um, the civil society as well to uh, support the work of, of uh, local authorities on migration. Um, so, uh, using that, uh, I'd like to turn to uh, Tarek uh, now, to, uh, if, you, if you'd like to tell us maybe more on these other actors of, of city societies uh, that, that support local authorities in that work, um, which, which is the civil society. Um, what, uh, what, kind of, what, what are your expectations for the civil society in this framework? How do you see their role in supporting Uh, progressive or solidarities at the local level. And I believe Tarek will be speaking in German as well. Yeah, genau. Um, ich würde auf Deutsch sprechen. Erstmal von meiner Seite auch vielen Dank. Yeah, I'll be speaking in German and I'd also like to thank uh, the previous speakers, but you all for organizing this project. And um, when talking about civil society, then I believe that we're talking about players who are involved uh, when states fail. I'd like to give an example of this. In 2018, the European states, when uh, faced with uh, saving, uh, uh, save and rescue of uh, refugees uh, on sea, uh, they failed because they blocked uh, civil uh, rescue action and uh, then immediately the civil society civil society came along and said okay this what is happening now is a politically uh, a, a chaos which the politicians wanted and we cannot that let that happen and we will go out and take to the streets and demonstrate and that was then the first uh, uh, moment where Zeebrücke was launched and that was uh, when the communities came along and they said good we cannot accept what's happening here we have to do something as a municipality as a small community in Germany for example and uh, that is how we had this campaign uh, safe havens in Germany in Bonn in Berlin there was a part but also elsewhere in many other municipalities, uh, 300 of them. And in the meantime, and uh, then because of this campaign, they said, okay, we're prepared to take in uh, people who were saved from sea with search and rescue action. And we are prepared to receive them here, to host them and to work with them on uh, living together and uh, on integration and uh, this political chaos which uh, was uh, really uh, um, done on purpose at the borders that's something we didn't want to um, accept it's not a response to people who are in need and uh, certainly that it does uh, not uh, agree with our values this kind of behavior and uh, the moment where the federal government uh, failed uh, with evacuation measures, immediately we saw the Luftbrücke, the airlift, 
civil society organization saying, okay, we will take on responsibility, we will evacuate. Uh, so from Afghanistan, we had flights from Kabul where people were evacuated. About 200 people evacuated by a civil society initiative. And, then, uh, and we can see the same thing happening as well at the borders with uh, Poland and Belarus, where uh, civil society said, we are not prepared to accept what's happening here. We're prepared to help people. We had houses which were lit up, and that was a kind of a signal towards the refugees that uh, they would find a safe haven in these houses where they can go and uh, warm up, get some hot food, and uh, charge their mobile phone so that they then carry on traveling. So you, that shows that civil society is uh, at this level. They're prepared to take in people. Uh, and uh, when respecting human rights values, that is where civil society plays a major role, has played a major role recently, and uh, also cooperating with committed municipalities. We, can, we have many examples at a European level where they say, okay, municipalities, even in countries where they do not have uh, um, officially uh, the function of helping here, they creatively helped. And uh, that is the expectation we as uh, civil society players have, what we expect of the communities uh, and uh, municipalities. We have to be in one line because uh, we're not talking just about the blockade in Germany from uh, the um, federal government, but we also see it in Poland, for example, and Hungary, Greece, uh, everybody wanted to show solidarity. And, uh, for example, when uh, in terms of deportation, when the government wants to deport people, then civil society says, no, this is not right. We need to support people. And uh, that is uh, what civil society players and municipalities have been doing over the past years. But, of course, we also expect this work to go on. That was what I had to say so far. Out of time, I will directly uh, turn to uh, Mireille Alphonse, who um, will give us uh, an impression of how this topic is handled in the city of Montreuil. I'm expecting quite a, of a different picture from what we heard in Bonn uh, and, and in general in Germany for different reasons. Uh, maybe you can tell us about uh, about your work, uh, Mireille, in a few in a few minutes. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Um, thank you very much to invite me to this meeting. I'll try to be understandable. I'm sorry, I don't speak either Greek or German, so I'll try it in English. Uh, I would like to thank you very much in name of my city and my friends, both uh, Heinrich Böll Stiftung and uh, Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, to have noticed us in uh, your next movie city, moving city web, website sorry um just to make a small picture of montreuil it's a city very near paris we have uh, 1010 uh, inhabitants uh, and people coming from all over the world uh, there are more than uh, 90 different nationalities in montreuil coming from both uh, from Europe, from Africa, from Asia, from everywhere. Uh, we have very old migrations, uh, more than a few hundred years old, uh, like gypsies, people coming from uh, Western Europe, because Montreuil was uh, an agricultural area very next Paris. Paris. We were uh, growing uh, fruit and vegetables, and gypsies were coming here to just grow those uh, vegetables uh, in, in, Paris, in Montreuil. Uh, we have also migrations from uh, the 20th century, uh, people, workers coming here from Algeria, Morocco, Mali, Senegal, mostly Africa, but also Middle East, and trying to find jobs. Uh, 
uh, and of course uh, the the families are coming with them from a lot of years and very recently we have people from uh, the war zones because in montreal there is the um, um, national uh, asylum court french asylum court so we often see people wandering in the streets very um uh very anxious because they are refused from the courts so we try to help them also so we have three um, um ways of helping and welcoming people the first is the first help uh, and the accompaniment to uh, the people the families who are coming here to go to what we call the common laws for housing, for uh, medicine, for uh, education for the children. Uh, so this is the very first ad we can sh we can share and offer. The second way of acting is integration or social inclusion for those who are here for a long time and those who have a family here or already jobs and uh, the third one is uh the, what we call i don't know if you say that in in german or greek what we call um decentralized cooperation i mean cooperation from city to city from here to abroad so we work with a palestinian city called beit sira uh with uh, with a turkish city uh, called bismil and for a very big area in mali called uh, yelimani uh, and we, we make a lot of cooperation with the, the, those cities and mostly on um, water supply and education and uh, um, help for women and children. Uh, so now very, very concrete uh, examples that I can tell, that I can say. We have joined the French uh, network called Envita. I, uh, I, I, will, I will take you the, the, the email, the, the internet uh, the website in the chat. Uh, it's a, um, a network uh, of cities in France that will welcome uh, refugees and migrating people. Uh, we are uh, providing a French lesson to the first uh, people who come in Montreuil, uh, about 1,000 uh, lessons and 1,000 uh, people are uh, having those lessons uh, per year. Uh, we, we, we work with social workers, uh, activists uh, to help families to, to, to access, access to decent care. And uh, by decent care, I will um, I think of uh, health care, of educational uh, care. We have uh, those, those days, we have very, a lot of people uh, coming from uh, Rome people. So Romania, Hungary, uh, Bulgaria. And we help them to, to, to bring the children to, to the doctors, to dentists uh, and to school. Uh, and and we we work with all those uh, association, and also we we help uh, the youngest because you know when when we talk about uh, migration from mostly people from Africa uh, in the 60s or 70s in France, uh, so now the people who had uh, migrated are old. They are grandfathers, uh, and and now we are working with their grandchildren and granddaughters, and some young people want to develop their, their country, so we help them uh, to develop a business between here and and Africa, uh, to to be able to develop uh, projects in their own countries if they want to. Uh, mostly, very often they develop uh, a business. Uh, who are making links uh, uh, between France and their countries. And uh, we have uh, at least uh, uh, 12 you, centers. Yeah. Sorry, is it, um, I, can we keep that for, I will just like to go back to our uh, speakers. Thank you so much for your, um, for your speech.
since mm -hmm. we have uh, just two minutes left on the clock, okay. I thought it would be interesting to uh, maybe look a little bit. I, I had to look at the chat and gathering what you all uh, talked about. I'd like to go back to um, the four of you. Um. Sorry, I think my connection just uh, got lost. So um, I was just saying that uh, hearing you speaking, I'm sure a lot of people in the audience are wondering, this sounds absolutely wonderful. Why don't we hear about more cities doing uh, this kind of work? Uh, and perhaps uh, here we need to bring some nuance in and say, well, this is uh, not as easy as, as it may seem. Um, Barbara, I know that you um, wrote a lot about cities of refuge. Uh, you also uh, talk about cities that refuse. Um, and someone in the chat just asked a question about the mandate of cities and, and what responsibilities they have. Uh, can you say in very few words, um, what, some, what are some of the challenges uh, uh, for cities? And I'll, I'll continue with a similar question to uh, the rest of you. Thank you. Thanks, Alia. Although a few words will be difficult because there's such a divergence. So where we started our project uh, four years ago with the idea you have cities of refuge and cities that refuse, we now know that it's much more uh, nuanced. We work with a categorization of um, explicit divergence and more implicit divergence. And then we distinguish there's defiance, but there's also dodging there's a uh, dilution etc we have a whole model which uh, people can read on our website but the point is that that often local authorities do quite a bit without really flagging it so that's one thing to uh, to, to mention another is as, as you already touched upon alia is the, the the political dimension of all this how 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 difficult it is often within a given political uh, context now there i think at the beginning we really expected that the more mandate local authorities have, the more they will do. But this doesn't seem to be the picture. So for instance, uh, in Turkey, where local authorities have very little formal mandate, they still put a lot of own resources, etc., in to doing the right thing. So I suppose the only thing I could say in a few words is um the importance of, of nuance also for instance on the political specter because people always think oh well, this is probably only progressive cities but there we've also encountered quite conservative mayors conservative coalitions that still uh engage quite uh proactively in um in another way of migration governance Thank you. And uh, following up to uh, a question to Katya and Mireille, then, um, could you then tell us where does uh, the resistance come from in your cities? Where, where, where are the challenges coming from? Maybe they are not coming from the places or the actors we would expect uh, would, uh, would try to uh, hinder some of the, of the local developments that you're trying to push for. Katya, would you like to go first and then we'll go quickly to Mireille. Also, es gibt natürlich auch in der Stadt wie Bonn. In a city like Bonn, of course, there is resistance from parts of the population, and they consist or in parts also in the city council. So, as a mayor of Bonn, I perceive from parts of or for some politicians that I am not, I don't have the legitimation to address or to contact the Minister for Interior. But overall, I can say that the civil society is very open and very supportive. And this is something that is shown and we see this uh, from both churches, the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church have always supported us in a very clear and open way. And this was really helpful. But of course, there are some issues where um, being the mayor, I would want to have a different situation. And I think Politically, this is also really important 
to make sure that refugees have a different right of to stay in our country. And this would be also the biggest wish I would have to the new federal government, because we see that people just are for many, many years don't know what is going to happen to their right. They lose perspective. So some things are excluded, like learning the language of the receiving country. And then they are frustrated and furious. And this is a situation that makes integration really difficult. And that's why, for the sake of integration and for a good cooperation and living in our city, I think this would be the most important thing. And also, we shouldn't forget that in a city like Bonn, we also have to face racism and also discrimination. Uh, for different reasons, because of their relig religion or the way they look like, etc. So this is something that we uh, shouldn't forget and something that we as a city um, need to also tackle and also do anti-discrimination work. So these are points that are on our to-do list and um, we do ask also other cities and also try to find out how we can learn from each other. And again, once again, thank you very much um, to Heinrich Böll Foundation and the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. Frictions and difficulties. Yeah, thank you. I think the main difficulty is uh, in Paris and in the Parisian area, there is no balance between the, the rest areas who are very rich and the poor ones who are very poor. Uh, and it means that the, the, the West cities and areas of Paris, they don't want any migrants, so they don't share. And, and, and Paris yet doesn't have a real migration uh, politics. So uh, the, the migrants, they all come to our cities. We are um, less than, I mean, well, 20 cities all around Paris at the east, northeast of Paris who welcome the migrants and they are all here, uh, which I don't care but which makes problems mostly of housings. And this is a very big problem, housings and money. Uh, for instance, in Montreux, we have 9,000 families waiting for have, to have a decent house, uh, a, a decent flat. And uh, when, when you see, the, so, People here are very friendly, they are very welcoming, but when you are uh, Polish or Spanish or even French, and when you are from a very low class family and you see that Malian people or Romanish people are, uh, are also uh, waiting to have a housing, it can build uh, difficulties even if people are very willing to share food, to share happy moments and all that, the, the fact of the, the housing is very difficult. I would say this is the main problem because here uh, we are a very leftist, leftist uh, town. Uh, so there are not here in Montreux much political problems. The right is very, very low and very feeble, so we don't have those problems. The problems are coming of the lack of money, the lack of space, and the lack of housing possibilities, mostly. Mm -hmm. And and, uh, and Tarek uh, said, I, I, I heard that uh, cities are doing what they can do when uh, states have uh, failed. And I totally agree with that. France has failed, and I think Europa has failed up to now. Thank you, Mihai. Um, and I think you just talked about, uh, you, you just mentioned the concept of not in my backyard, uh, which is uh, um, what we witness in some places in, in Europe. 
uh, including in urban areas, which is um, when some local populations just have some towards uh, migration. Um, and uh, there is also a question about this in the in the chat about how do we uh, engage with smaller uh, cities and smaller local authorities on this question. Um, Tarek, perhaps a, a question to you to close uh, rapidly on this topic. Uh, how do you see uh, the role of the civil society there? How can civil society work with um, local authorities that might not seem so progressive, uh, quote unquote? Also, I see, I see here two, um, two sides. Well, I see two sides. So, first, uh, there are there is of course the pos there are possibilities that haven't been used. Uh, let's look at the question of integration, or the question of the right to stay, because at the end of the day, it is not just to make sure that people can flee in a safe way but they also but also to make sure that where they arrive it's a safe place and i have to i can see very positive examples here in germany but there's also room for improvement in other cities of germany i have great hopes with a different german government that there will be a transition when we talk about uh welcoming refugees, this um, position of blockage that we used to have in the previous government, that this will change. And I see also a lot of potential to continue with new steps that the municipalities can decide themselves who they want to welcome or can decide independently without having to ask the federal government or other type of permission. So this will be a sustainable migration policy because finally the municipalities can play a very essential role and will also work together with the refugees. And I see better possibilities, a better possibility to, to shape a new migration policy together with the civil society. Of course, this is a huge task. We need to mobilize the civil society and also get connected. This is something that has started two years ago in Germany, especially with this um, network safe haven. And we had this um, attitude of blocking any kind of influx. So we need to work on this in order to make sure to achieve this normal situation and then think of how we can continue. Thank you very much, Tarek. And uh, I'm very sorry to close this panel. Uh, I think we could go on for several hours, but unfortunately we have a quite a full agenda for today. Uh, thank you very much to uh, the four of you for uh, laying the ground for our conference today and for the launch of the Moving Cities website. Uh, I think you already pointed to some of the solutions that uh, we're going to continue discussing, uh, including uh, networking, like you just mentioned, Tarek, uh, city to city exchanges. I think you, Mireille, talked about this uh, and, and learning by doing and learning from other cities. Uh, so um, thank you so much for your words. Uh, and uh, we hope you uh, you stay in the, in the chat uh, later uh, this afternoon. Um, I will uh, then turn to our audience again and, um, you know, using what we just heard from our speakers, we were going to um, ask you to fill the second survey of uh, today's event, which uh, precisely touches on the question of solutions and tools. Uh, what kind of tools do you think uh, would be useful uh, to create more welcoming policies uh, for migration at the local level? Uh, we've spoken about networks and cooperation. Uh, we've spoken about uh, innovative tools and approaches and, and how can we find more information about this, uh, but also more practical and hands-on experiences uh, made before cities or for uh, the civil society or other uh, practitioners. Um, and this is moving quite fast. Uh, but I see that a lot of our respondents are in agreement 
that stronger networks in cooperation uh, are, are quite important as well as information on innovative tools and approaches that are already out there. So uh, without further ado, I will turn to our uh, second panel, which is precisely about that, uh, which is about launching the Moving Cities website. Uh, I invite uh, the panelists for the second uh, panel to uh, switch on their camera if they'd like. Um, we will be talking about the Moving Cities website, which is, as I said, precisely about gathering information on what cities are already doing uh, on migration. Uh, I'm very pleased to be joined by some of the people that stand behind this, uh, this website and that helped populate it and document these practices. Um, I will first turn to uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Stephanie Krohn, who uh, will tell us about the website as well as her research, and then we will go back to our panel and have uh, hopefully some time for discussion. Uh, so Stephanie, uh, could you uh, start by telling us about the Moving Cities project, what, what stands behind that, where the, did the idea come from, um, and uh, what is the website, um, what can you tell us about it, how can we use it? Uh, and I think you'd like to also um, tell us about the research that you've done on the cities of uh, Zaragoza and Barcelona. Now, um, I should say that uh, Stephanie is a professor at the Evang Evangelical University in Berlin, and she specializes in migration and refugee studies. Uh, and so she has been with the Moving Cities project for, uh, for a while and under wearing different hats, if I should say. Um, Stephanie, the floor is yours. Ja, ähm, vielen Dank für die nette Präsentation, Anja. Und ähm, ich möchte auch, dass ähm, das Publikum Thank you for this presentation, Maria, and I have to greet the audience. And unfortunately, at 11.45, I will need to leave because I will be teaching a seminar on solidarity in cities and the movement. So I will probably not be able to remain to the end of the discussion, but I'm nevertheless very happy to be here today. And uh, on your question, Alia, I'd firstly like to answer that the whole project of this moving cities mapping project um, developed from civil society and it was uh, with the social meetings between um, migrants communities and associations in different uh, european countries and as a reaction if we look at back at the summer of migration 2015 and uh, then the blockade of the Italian ports in 2008, June 2018, when the then Interior Minister Salvini in Italy decided to close Italian ports to civil search and rescue vessels. That was when the project uh, began. It was a highly political con a context and with lots of very conflict-ridden and uh, as a reaction very many European humanitarian and search and rescue NGOs but also other activists groupings and movements uh, like Sea uh, Watch Alarm for Mediterranean and Open Farm Event Jugend and Seebrücke uh, they all got together also with uh, some mayors from Palermo Barcelona, Naples and elsewhere, and other representatives of these cities, and they got together and connected under the slogan of From the Sea to the City. And that also describes the transnational perspective unfolding in the cities and municipalities. The network was founded in Palermo in 2018 in the spirit of the Charter of Palermo, and this charter is a point of reference for the whole movement of uh, cities and municipalities in solidarity and uh, the welcoming policy, because uh, here we have the right to mobility, freedom of movement, global movement, all that is uh, set into focus here. That's why the network is called uh, Palermo Charter Platform Process and uh, decriminalization of search and rescue at sea and international solidarity is claimed. 
and the possibility of having uh, corridors of solidarity, so to have safe paths uh, to Europe from other countries for refugees and migrants. And now this will be interesting for us, strengthening the movement, the Palermo Charter Platform process uh, is for all for the movement of uh, solidarity cities and municipalities throughout Europe. So moving cities, this uh, project is uh, one, not only one, but it is one project and part of a whole series of uh, campaigns and activities in the Palermo Charter process. We also have conferences, interactive networking. And uh, we, I used to work for Rosa Luxemburg Foundation and I was in charge of, for international migration uh, and uh, education and uh, in 2019 we began to work on this project project with Seebrücke, but it was initiated of course by Seebrücke and uh, Rosa Luxemburg and Heinrich Böll Foundations, they basically helped with financing, uh, knowledge, networking, research and support of the project. I will also talk about the map and I will show it to you in a minute. So we can see over 700 towns, cities or villages uh, having uh, publicly declared that they are open for migrants and refugees. And uh, I found this uh, quite astonishing because I didn't know this map and the mapping system exactly. But I saw that where I came from, uh, come from in Vestavat, we have two little uh, villages or places uh, very close to where I used to grow up. That's one place, uh, a village, and Hackenburg, which is a small town, they're also on the map. So the map shows that it's not just the large cities and hubs opening up to a more humane uh, migration policy, but also increasingly more smaller places. Then we have uh, 17 or 18 researchers from the whole of Europe doing in-depth research into welcoming policies in nearly 40 cities in Poland, Germany, Switzerland, Italy, Spain, Greece, France, and the Netherlands. And uh, now I will try to show you the website and to share my screen with you. Can you see this? This is the starting page of this Moving Cities map project. And the map has three targets. First of all, political propaganda, that's what I call it. So we wanted to visualize right at the outset how many cities and municipalities in Europe have uh, united in terms of uh, positive policies towards migrants and refugees uh, or expressed in the South for it. And that in contrast to the national or European level. So we wanted to uh, show this. We have a similar map for the US and for North America, for Canada, the sanctuary cities. And there you have hundreds and hundreds of municipalities and towns uh, um, wishing for a progressive migration policy and wanting to implement it. And the second goal here it's, it's my problem. I'm having a little problem here. A little bit of a problem because I can't carry on, unfortunately. 
Okay, well, the second goal or target we set is uh, networking and exchange of knowledge and inspiring approaches to progressive uh, municipal migration policy. We want to strengthen this, and uh, I'll just click on to Germany here. Okay, not working. Then I will switch to my PowerPoint. Unfortunately, at the moment, I cannot open this page. Uh, I have opened the tabs, but anyway, I'll show you a PowerPoint uh, I have as a backup. These 28 uh, cities and towns where we have focus points where, with research uh, can be seen here. Usually you have the map behind them and you can see them now in the category of feature cities. And the third goal, I mean, this is what you can look for out for here, but the third one is new cities and municipalities that are not yet uh, on the map and we want to inspire them to also become part of this project and the map and there we have uh, add your city you can see it down here bottom right and then the structure of the website corresponds uh, to these uh, three main goals. So visualization, of uh, political power, so to speak, of uh, towns and cities with a welcoming policy, then networking and exchange between the cities and municipalities uh, being part of this map, and then inspiration for new participants. But on the website, you can see that you can do all sorts of things. You can uh, search for countries, you can search for country profiles for towns or cities, uh, you can uh, look at uh, particular cities, uh, these featured cities, where you have uh, quite an extensive uh, profile. You can look for networks, but you can also search for 50 inspiring uh, access points uh, and special categories for progressive local integration policies. For example, inspiring approaches, social rights, resident status, security, political participation, uh, policies uh, for undocumented migrants, um, employment market, and so on and so forth. And uh, since it's easier for you yourself to go and search and look at it and surf around, I will give you the link. The page has gone online. That happened today, and so this is the input as to what I have to say on this page. I don't know, Alia, do you want me to carry on? Yes, please, I'll talk about research. Examples that we have, uh, and our, what our researchers, you included, have worked on. Uh, since you, uh, you have a commitment, uh, you can uh, start by um, telling us about your research uh, in Spain uh, and tell us in your few words um, what, what, you found, what you found particularly interesting about the, the city of Zaragoza, which I think is the one you're going to focus on. Okay, yeah, thank, thank you. you. So I researched on a city profile 
and uh, the two cities I've already mentioned them, Zaragoza and Barcelona. So, and I decided to say something about Zaragoza today because Barcelona is uh, relatively well known for a welcoming policy and for a progressive urban uh, policy. And it is also a political flagship for the entire European movement of welcoming cities. And that's why I would like to focus on Zaragoza today, because it is a city that is not as known. It is also much smaller. It is the capital of the province Aragon. And we chose Zaragoza for a regional um, point of views. We wanted to Valencia, Barcelona, for example, um, is quite well known. We wanted to look um, in central Spain, what is going on. And what I would like to uh, mention before I talk about Zaragoza for Spain, the municipal movement, so the left sided uh, movement, political left movement was quite important, especially in the cities that we visited, all that were uh, in the ruling in 2015. And this municipal movement for Spain have shown their solidarity and also expressed their welcoming policy. And also some of these things were institutionalized. And this is something that is shown in Zaragoza. It's a city with around 700,000 inhabitants. And it's been uh, even longer than 2015, a city that has been marked by migration from people who are crossing the city to go to France. There's also a big uh, community from Nicaragua. And the status of the people of people from Nicaragua is a precarious status and uh, very often these are people with no documents. However, they do have a very strong community and it is also a Roma community. It's around 50,000 uh, people who live in the uh, wider area of Zaragoza. So this is the important things to, these are the things to know about Zaragoza. So what we did uh, during the pandemic, of course, we uh, couldn't travel to the city, so this was an online research. So I had to conduct my research online and I interviewed uh, politicians and social workers online. And I also yeah, did all the research about data, sociological data about the city online. The programs that um, we have here was the following, or what is so special about Saragossa is, is the following. So it has a very active uh, civil society and existing migrant movements uh, were an ideal starting point. And one starting point was, for example, the Casa de las Culturas. This is the cultural house. and they were institutionalized and were used to implement migrational policy. So from the Casa de las Culturas, uh, this NGO that was active in the migrant field was uh, or transformed to an institution, into an institution. And that's something that you don't find very often. You find this institutionalization on a municipal level. And we can see that um, this was a very interesting and useful approach. The next point that is very 
interesting and special about Zaragoza that municipal local workers dealing with or who wanted to support migrants and were very active in this field were strongly involved in this process of the solidarity policy of the city and also strongly uh, involved in the implementation of this uh, policy. So this medium level between the civil society and the politician or and the administration, these social workers played an important role. And the other aspect is, and I go back to the community from Nicaragua and the Sinti and Roma, they tried to use a participative process and to create uh, or within this the so-called urban citizenship program they try to include all the cultural minorities and to offer a new concept of urban citizenship and uh, people from Nicaragua or the, Nicar the com community from Nicaragua and the Sinti and Roma were involved as well. And to conclude, I would like to say what is so interesting and special about this city is the following. From an idea to create a solidarity policy focused on refugees or migrants or people without documents, that this also cr helped to create a concept or a program for a new intercultural society and also created this urban citizenship. So based on a topic of migration, um, something else developed, a topic for everyone. And the city is, thanks to this policy and the institutionalization, stands for a diverse and intercultural policy. And it changed for everyone. So being open for integration doesn't just mean uh, is not only related to people who come to the city, but it's also for people who are already there. And this leads to a more diverse living together and cohabitation in the city. So this was it about my research. The technical aspect could uh, allow us to. Um, everybody is welcome to uh, check it out for themselves. It's moving-cities.eu and you can have a look at which cities are on there. Uh, there was a question about how can you add a city uh, to the network of cities that are present on the website and the answer is you have an add your city button at the bottom right of the of the screen and you can there uh, propose uh, practices from your city from other cities that are not on the website. So it's a pretty interactive and, and participatory uh, pro Project. Uh, speaking of participation, so thank you so much, Stephanie. I know you have to be very soon, so uh, please feel free to do so whenever uh, needed. Um, I will turn to our um, our panel of researchers who have helped document and, and populate the website, uh, looking at, at other European cities. Uh, we have Sarah Millet, who is a PhD candidate with the Cities of Refuge project that we have just heard about uh, this morning. She studies legal obligations of uh, local governments and other actors in the field of refugee reception and integration in different cities in uh, Germany and the Netherlands. And she has focused on the, on the cities of Tilburg, Utrecht and Amsterdam for the Moving Cities project. Um, next on my screen is Federico Alagna. He's a postdoctoral researcher at the Faculty of Political and Social Sciences at the Scuola Normale Superiore in Italy. And his research uh, focuses on EU and Italian migration policies uh, with a focus on bottom-up uh, approaches and on the role of civil society in policy making and policy implementation. And he uh, not only knows about this topic theoretically, but also practically, he used to serve as a deputy mayor for culture and public education uh, for the city of Messina in Sicily. And for moving cities, he, uh, he uh, documented uh, the work of another Sicilian city, uh, Palermo. 
Uh, and uh, last and but not least with us is Olga Lafazani, uh, who is an adjunct lecturer at the Department of History and Philosophy of Science um, at the National and Capodistrian Capo uh, University of Athens. Uh, and she is also the research co coordinator of a project called 100 Memories, uh, which looks at the history of arrivals and departures uh, that have shaped uh, different Greek port cities uh, over the last century. Uh, and she uh, researched cases of uh, Chilos and Livadia um, in Greece for the project. Thank you all very much for um, joining us and for bringing in your experience and expertise today. Um, I suggest we go around the room and uh, hear from the different cases that you've covered. Um, if you can all tell us about the cities that you've researched, uh, what makes these cities uh, um, um, special or different, uh, what kind of policy areas do they cover particularly? Um, there was a question in the chat about the institutional um, aspect of refugee policy. So maybe if you can tell us how cities deal with institutional issues on uh, refugee migration policy uh, briefly. I'd like to uh, maybe, uh, being mindful of the time, stick to uh, five minutes uh, for each speaker. Uh, so um, please be mindful of that. And um, we can start with uh, with Sarah, maybe, if you'd like to uh, kick us off. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. So um, for moving cities, I researched three Dutch cities, Tilburg, Utrecht, and Amsterdam. Um, for these profiles, I uh, interviewed representatives from local governments, from civil society, and I studied lots of documents. Dutch municipalities really like to uh, generate a lot of documents. <laughs> so um, there's also, uh, there was a lot of information there too. Now, um, Dutch municipalities compared to uh, many other European cities have um, a lot of responsibilities and a very clear mandate actually by now when it comes to migration, migration governance, um, and also more generally social policies as a result of decentralization. And this means that uh, there are a lot of local projects, but also really policies at the local level that are increasingly tailored to uh, recognize uh, to refugees. Now Tilburg, um, uh, so this means that um, there, um, that there are many cities in the Netherlands working on refugee, refugee inclusion, but Tilburg Amsterdam and Utrecht really stand out from other cities and from national approaches um, in the following ways. Amsterdam and Tilburg uh, have really become known uh, nationally for their inclusionary measure, measures for recognized refugees. Um, both cities developed um, this support when they had no mandate um, and also uh, really um, putting in a lot of their own resources and capacity. Um, and what they did is they really identified the shortcomings of national policies frameworks at the time and tested um, and piloted their own um, orientation and language pro programs. Um, Utrecht, meanwhile, and we'll hear from that later, I think today, was uh, pioneering a completely different approach to asylum accommodation um, um, and housing for recognized refugees. And it was also uh, very successful, it has been successful for a long time in finding uh, durable human rights-based solutions to um, irregular stay for undocumented migrants. Now, these local innovations started out as projects, often really, really also in close collaboration with civil society. Um, but in each of these cities, they were institutionalized, so they were secured in the long run uh, also by really integrating them into local policy frameworks and allocating structural uh, funding. Now, as I said later, we'll hear about Utrecht, so I'll just briefly say something about Tilburg. Um, Tilburg is the sixth largest city in the Netherlands. Um, it is a university city. And um, what sets Tilburg apart from other um, Dutch municipalities is that it very early on, after 2015, um, started developing its own orientation and language program, which went way beyond uh, the minimal requirements at the time, spanning several weeks, really putting in its own funding. And it collaborated with very small municipalities in the region that were actually not able to keep up with the innovations of larger cities, um, like Tilburg. 
And also, it worked together closely with a um, refugee advisory council that gave critical feedback on the development of this uh, program. Now, I'll, I, it, you can read on the website why Tilburg's actors uh, did, uh, insisted on regional collaboration and, and how they did this, but I'll just say for now that I think this is very important for human rights-based um, uh, approaches. Because, uh, for instance, in the Netherlands, refugees are, cannot choose where they stay during asylum procedures or where they are allocated housing after they complete procedures. And because there are huge differences between municipalities, um, this creates a sort of lottery um, rather than equal access to rights. So Tilburg really um, is contributing to a fairer, more consistent, coordinated, and even cost efficient um, uh, system. On the website, and I'll conclude with this, uh, you can also read more about Utrecht and Amsterdam. Uh, for those of you who are interested in Amsterdam, maybe it's nice to know that um, the city is also really, really thinking about big data and how to use, how to monitor the impacts of its own solutions and approaches, and to use that information to um, uh, identify extra vulnerable groups, such as single women uh, with children. And Amsterdam is a city that um, uh, where it was not always so straightforward, there were also conflicts in the past with civil society. And um, in, interestingly enough, the city is currently working with over 25 NGOs, uh, many of whom were previously very critical of the city government um, in its program for undocumented migrants. So more, more about that on the website. Thank you very much, Sarah, and also thank you for sticking to the limited time that uh, I allocated for speakers. Um, I think we, we move uh, to Southern Europe uh, a little bit. Thank you, Stephanie, and uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, we're, we're moving uh, to uh, Southern Europe. Uh, perhaps, Federico, do you want to, um, to go next and tell us about the case of Palermo? Um, what was uh, interesting in what Sarah just said is um, how local authorities like Tilburg are trying to compensate for um, inequalities that are created at national level. Um, can you maybe also touch on that, on how Palermo is trying to balance uh, uh, these, these questions at the local level? Yes, uh, thank you, Alia, and um, thank you for, for inviting me here today. And I think it's um, I mean, I, I'm really happy to, to be able to share, like, you know, very quickly some of the findings related to Palermo, as I believe they can be interesting and uh, relevant in um, the understanding of the overall approach of the Moving Cities project. Um, also, my research was essentially based on uh, uh, desk research, uh, analysis of several primary and secondary sources, and uh, interviews with activists. And uh, this kind of work, um, made me uh, able to uh, actually have a uh, have a broad look uh, and a complete look at the city of Palermo on how uh, the city of Palermo um, as, a, as a community essentially developed uh, some uh, concrete actions in terms of uh, migration and uh, um, uh, integration over the years and uh, uh, I think uh, um, this is uh, particularly relevant especially insofar as this was a process that involved uh, to different extents and in very different ways, changing along the time, uh, both the municipality, so the institutional level, and civil society actors. Uh, starting off with uh, uh, this aspect that Alia, you were mentioning in uh, introducing me, uh, I would say that uh, maybe this is the key element of the Palermo contribution to uh, the European efforts uh, of uh, cities and uh, um, uh, civil society organizations to. Uh, change migration policies and practices. Uh, Palermo is uh, an example, uh, in my opinion, as far as I could understand for, for my research, uh, especially when it comes to challenging uh, the border regime in, in immigration policies that uh, exist in Italy and beyond Italy, I would say, in the European Union as such. Uh, Palermo um, and its community, so both its institutional side and uh, the, the, the wide variety of civil society actors uh, uh, very much engaged uh, since uh, uh, like for, for many years 
in the um, uh, a proposition of an alternative to the dominant framework of closing harbors, closing borders, and uh, uh, leaving uh, certain rescue vessels at sea uh, without uh, letting them enter Italian uh, territorial waters. Uh, by standing up in solidarity with uh, such rescue organizations, by openly challenging, uh, especially uh, during the ministership of Matteo Salvini, the policies of the Italian government, and trying to be a clear voice uh, against uh, the, the, the dominant framework as such. Uh, this element um, was uh, uh, was shared by the institution and by the civil society actors, but of course it was uh, very important and very relevant in the uh, Italian political context, given the uh, the role, the political capital that uh, the mayor of Palermo, uh, Luca Orlando, could spend. I mean, as a prominent figure in the in the national uh, political uh, arena. This was very important because uh, in a moment in which uh, uh, civil society organizations were left alone, were targeted uh, by judicial investigations, by uh, political policing that uh, took place in parliament and outside parliament, I mean, the streets and the society as such, having institutional figures that were standing up in solidarity with them, with political figures that were raising their voices, make them heard, uh, was absolutely crucial uh, in order not to let them uh, alone and uh, uh, essentially to protect them to the, to the widest uh, uh, possible extent. Uh, in this sense, I would say that uh, one of the key uh, pillars of uh, the, the action of Palermo in this field actually relates to uh, this uh, challenging of the uh, uh, closing up of policies that were dominant and still are dominant uh, all over Europe. A second element I think uh, I would like to mention relates uh, directly to another question that uh, came up uh, as far as I understood from uh, also the, the previous panel and was uh, uh, also um, introducing our, our discussion here today, uh, which relates to the institutional level. So uh, on the one side, Palermo was very active in, in this field, so it was active in the solidarity mechanisms, but on the other side, I think it, uh, it is worth mentioning also uh, the um, what Palermo did from an institutional point of view, and uh, um, in this sense, uh, it, uh, I think that the, the, the core element Let's do what uh, it is called um, the Council of Cultures, which is uh, um, uh, an institutional body that uh, is, uh, was established in Palermo in uh, 2013, mm -hmm. um, which in a nutshell uh, uh, has the, the, the ambition and the, the mandate to uh, provide uh, uh, political representation and institutional representation to all those citizens that are non-Italian, I mean, that do not have Italian citizenship and therefore cannot uh, uh, vote according to Italian laws for uh, the, the election of the mayor, the uh, city council, etc. So essentially these are citizens uh, who uh, do not have any institutional representation and have no voice in, uh, from an institutional perspective. Since uh, 2013, there is this uh, consultative body in the city of Palermo, which was officially established uh, uh, by a um, city decree. So it's an official body, which uh, uh, is elected by these uh, uh, like long-term immigrant citizens and uh, uh, has this, uh, this aim to provide this political representation. And uh, it's, uh, um, it's very relevant because uh, um, most of the times we tend to think of uh, um, reception integration policies in wider terms that uh, have to do uh, with the emergency that we deal with every day, uh, you know, with a, uh, people uh, looking for a um, place of, uh, of safety uh, in, in parts of the world. But the truth is that uh, there is also much to do in the ordinary administration of uh, integration policies, and in this sense, uh, making sure that uh, what the city is working on uh, uh, reflects and takes into account the demands and the needs of uh, uh, long-term uh, uh, immigrants and citizens is absolutely crucial. And uh, this kind of tools and institutional tools can be uh, a very important uh, response. Uh, thank you for, um, for your attention. Thank you very much, Federico, uh, for uh, taking us around Palermo. And uh, maybe we're moving from one island to another. 
And uh, I think, Olga, you wanted to speak specifically about the case of uh, Tilos, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in Greece. Um, and uh, maybe if you can uh, also reflect on what Federico just pointed out, which is this balance between emergency and maybe ad hoc practices. And I think Sarah also talked about this uh, in more institutionalized practices in cities and how, how Tilos is also managing this tension. Yes. Okay, thank you, Alia. Um, so, Tilos, to give you a, a rough idea, is like a small island of 800, ref uh, of 800 residents in the Aegean. And although, in a way, it is so tiny in size, it really sets a big example on a different approach on migration. So, if in the prevailing policies of managing migration, there is either a um, criminalization or a victimization of the refugees. In the case of Tilos, a totally different approach is at place. Refugees are seen as people who could actively participate in the social life and offer in the local community. So if at least the last four or five years in, the more, in most of the other Greek cities, the slogan, we cannot take any more refugees, is prevailing. Maria Kamalifieri, the mayor of Tilos, is totally reversing this discourse by stating we are honored by the refugees' choice to live in our island. And this is not only a discursive strategy, but is translated into concrete policies and practices in the island. So from the summer of the refugee crisis, this emergent period mentioned by the others as well, uh, in 2015, the locals, the, the local community started spontaneously taking action and organizing uh, to, to help the refugees. First of all, they organized rescue operations in the sea with their own boats, uh, as the island of Tilos is very close to the Turkish coast. And from these first days, also a first reception space was organized. Food and items were offered to the refugees through grassroots local structures. Gradually, uh, institutional initiatives were taken by the municipality of Tilos, involving housing and apartments, healthcare, and education for both adults and the children in cooperation with international organizations like UNHCR, but also with other like smaller NGOs. In addition, and in contrast to most of the other places throughout Greece, jobs were also offered to the refugees in local businesses. However, what makes really Tilos taking a step further is not only including refugees as workers in local businesses, but through the opening of Irina Cooperative Cheese Factory by the city authorities, they created the opportunity for refugees to be co-owners of a local business. In the spring of 2018, the cheese factory started operating, and in a way, the idea behind it is that it functioned as a cooperative where locals already settled migrants and the newly arrived refugees would be partners. As Maria Kamal Ferry, the mayor of Tilos, insisted, refugees wouldn't be only workers, but co-owners of this business. In this sense, we can say that in Tilos, the welcoming of migrants goes beyond humanitarian, humanitarianism or care to a process of a more equal participation in the economic life of the island. Still, I think what makes the example of Tilos really unique is not, in a way, it's one of the different initiatives taken, but I think the overall approach and the commitment to include refugees in the community of the island so it's also the public schools, it's the sport activities, the, the choir of the children, uh, the local celebrations that are always invited. So does the story of Tilo sounds too utopian to be true? 
still it seems that there are no secret ingredients in the potion. It's just a basic self-preconception that refugees are not a threat against which local society has to defend itself. They are people in need of support, but also people who can offer through their participation in the local society. And really, is this basic preconception more unrealistic or utopian than the overall EU and national policies that are trying to defend themselves from people who wish to settle and rebuild their livelihoods? That's all from me. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Olga, for uh, giving us a an idea of uh, how Tilos, such a, a smaller municipality, also deals with this question. And, um, I think uh, you have given us quite a good sense of how um, how much diversity uh, we find uh, across Europe in different cities. Now, um, I would love to follow up with more questions, but I'm also mindful of the time. I know that we have interpret in interpreters working with us uh, who, who have already been on the uh, a constant uh, call for some hours. So we will uh, soon take a little break, uh, but I think um, we will continue the conversation and some of you will be uh, around for the workshops as well. So there will be possibilities for people who want to ask some questions then. Um, so as I said, I think we, we, we have covered a lot of ground already and given us a sense of the, the diversity of, of situations that cities face and the diversity of solutions that they bring about. Um, and I, on that note, I would invite people to check out the website again and have a look at what other municipalities and other uh, countries are also coming up with, what kind of, of practices and policies they have, uh, they have developed. Uh, but you also touched on a quite important note. I found, uh, I think, Olga, you mentioned that with the example of the mayor of Tilos, uh, which is um, the agency of migrants themselves. Uh, so we're not only talking about what um, cities do to migrants, but also what migrants do to cities and what they bring to cities. Uh, and I think this is also reflected in the way that you, you drafted your research um, uh, reports about the different cities and certainly something that we should keep in mind uh, for this afternoon session. Um, thank you very much to the three of you for joining us and sorry that we ran uh, over time today. I uh, would have loved to keep you for um, uh, for more time, but that's, that's just not uh, possible for now. Um, what will happen now is that we will take a short break uh, and we will resume our session at 12.30. Uh, they will be, um, you will be, you'll have the chance to join parallel workshops uh, at 12.30. So uh, in order for these sessions to start on time, I would kindly ask you to join us a little bit before 12.30 so that we can then dispatch participants in the three, in the two different uh, workshop sessions. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and I will see you in a bit at uh, 12.30. Welcome back everyone. I hope you could all make your way back uh, from the workshops to the main meeting session. Um, we are about to uh, conclude our uh, conference. Um, I think the workshops were extremely useful. I attended one of them in uh, bringing out the practical solutions that we witness at the local level. Um, in speaking about solutions, uh, we presented earlier today the Moving Cities website. Um, I hope some of you had a chance to take a look at it. Um, and we would actually uh, very much like to hear from you, from participants, to know how you see yourself using such a platform. So there will be now a link uh, shared in the chat box, a link to the third poll um, for uh, today's conference. Uh, you can click on this link once you see it, it's right there. Um, it will uh, take you to another survey um, that will ask you how how you think you could use such uh, a platform as the Moving Cities website, um, as well as the practices that are available uh, on it. Would you see it as an inspiration for, uh, for looking for new tools and new approaches uh, in your work, as an inspiration to network, or as a resource to um, 
to your argument vis-a-vis uh, -vis your local or national um, administration, depending on the work that, that you do. Um, may it be working for a local authority, for a civil society organization, or as an active citizen. Uh, we see that a lot of you uh, consider it as, a, as an inspiration to uh, search for innovative tools and approaches, as well as a support for uh, argumenting uh, for an, another migration policy at the local or national level. So that's uh, great to hear. Thank you. Um, and uh, you, you probably understood today that the Moving Cities project is not uh, set in stone and doesn't limit itself to, to this website. Uh, of course, it's a collaborative project. You're all invited to um, visit the website and add your contributions there. Uh, but beyond the platform itself, I think the organizers were also interested in hearing uh, what kind of uh, events, or what kind of follow-up event you would be interested in. So uh, we will now take the last poll of today's event um, that will uh, take you to another survey, which asks you what kind of potential follow-up event you would be interested in. Uh, given the discussions that we had today, would you be more interested in uh, a, a network um, event at the local or regional level or a more a broader event at the European level? Um, and here, um, please feel free to um, be in touch with the organizers at Heinrich Böll, Rosa Luxemburg and uh, Zeebrücke um, if you have ideas or suggestions. Uh, for uh, follow-up activities. Um, they can probably post a, a contact email in the chat uh, for you to uh, be in touch in the future if you would like uh, to. Uh, we see now that there is a, a, a pretty a balanced divide between European and regional uh, networking. So that's uh, uh, quite interesting to see. Um, Thank you very much for your contributions here. As I said, feel free to get in touch with the organizers if you'd like to uh, discuss your ideas. Uh, and speaking about networking, uh, we uh, are joined by uh, Ms. Annalisa Boni from EuroCities for our concluding remarks. She will help us conclude our discussions for today. Uh, she is joining us as a Secretary General of EuroCities. Uh, which is a network of over 200 cities spanning across Europe and beyond, right? Uh, and Ms. Boni herself has 25 years of professional experience in EU public affairs in the field of local and regional government. Uh, and she has worked toward a stronger recognition of cities in, um, within the local, uh, within the European agenda. Uh, I think Ms. Boni, you can, we can say that you are a, a champion of the local agenda. Uh, and we heard uh, quite a lot today already about uh, networks such as your cities, but also other other platforms. So we would be very interested in hearing your perspective on the discussions we had today on the role of local authorities on migration. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alia. Um, and uh, good morning or good midday. I don't know, here in Brussels is already great. Sounds already like we, it looks already like we are in the evening. But anyway, good day everyone. Uh, thank you so much for inviting Eurocities and myself uh, to this uh, really interesting event. I could not attend it, uh, unfortunately, you know, all of it in, the, in the morning, but the program really looked so good. And the content was really like sound, uh, I mean, the, the not sound, music for my ears, really, because the, the messages that were in your flyer and the things that have emerged are exactly in line with uh, the work we do in Eurocities. And in your flyer, as I said, you say that uh, cities and municipalities all over Europe show that another migration policy is not only possible, but that is already happening. Well, that for me is really the point of it all. It's, it, you know, the point is really that cities and municipalities all over Europe, municipalities all over Europe have been acting since a long time and have been showing leadership on welcoming refugees, both in terms of offering local capacities and in integration structures and offering an integration culture and paths and so on, but also by taking a, a strong political stand towards you know, the national and the EU uh, institutions and the EU uh, level. Um, because at the moment, uh, there are you know, many concerning developments 
if you if you think here in brussels the negotiations of the new pact uh, on migration and asylum are stalled you know they've been blocked uh, and therefore you know a reform of, of eu legislation in this field is therefore also blocked uh, and at the same time we see more and more uh, reports of illegal pushbacks and violations you know that violations of EU human rights uh, on migrants and, and refugees at our, you know, the external borders of the EU, in Croatia, with Bosnia and Greece, with Turkey, in Poland, Poland, with Belarus, and so on, Western and the, on the Western and the Central Mediterranean routes, and all this with standards of human rights that EU countries should really, uh, you know, uh, be careful about. So it's exactly in this climate, though, that we can still remain hopeful. And that's why I liked your sentence in the flyer, uh, because we can remain uh, hopeful uh, because of local leadership, because of leadership by cities and municipalities that take a stand for humanity, for you know, for responsibility, for solidarity, and so that's really something that uh, drives us, drives us all. And uh, at least in Euro cities, we have, uh, for instance, already in 2016. Yeah, we have um, created, we have launched a dedicated initiative on this issue that is called Solidarity Cities, exactly because in that, you know, you know that period very well in 2015. And, you know, it was really a response to the rise in the number of refugees coming to Europe and, uh, and the need for solidarity with those fleeing persecutions and violence and with cities that were already hosting a lot of uh, populations of newcomers. The city of Athens and uh, Eurocities launched that initiative because you remember Athens was really very well, you know, very first line. Um, and so this this initiative had the uh, aim to support cities committed to solidarity in the field of refugee reception and integration. And, you know, it was really about the principles of uh, calling for the principles of humanity and responsibility and the members of this uh, initiative we're really saying let's cooperate among cities to create more cohesive and inclusive societies basically and let's work together on a very practical way to really uh, welcome uh, refugees and let's be solidaire in this, in this sense so that that was that was already in the in the in, in 2015 but last year also we published uh, two letters uh, addressed to the president of the european commission the European Parliament and the Council, the European Council. One letter was in response uh, to the overcrowded and inhumane conditions in the Greek refugee camps uh, and saying that, uh, you know, cities were ready to take in unaccompanied uh, minors and refugee children. So that was very, a very strong call. And then another open letter, uh, anyway, open but directed to them in response to the fire, you know, the fire in the Maria camp in Lesbos, in Lesbos, Lesbos. Uh, so the mayors of Amsterdam, Barcelona, Hanover, Valencia, and many other uh, let, um, mayors shared a joint letter to the heads of European institutions to ask for better European solidarity and really say we need to welcome uh, refugees. So, you know, again, it's really about calling for Europe to step up to provide shelter, comfort, safety, and say, you know, work with cities also for that, recognize their role. And uh, we also did, uh, I mean, very recently we offered, um, you know, many cities across Europe offered to host Afghan refugees following you know, the Taliban takeover of the country, and like London, Lisbon, um, quite a few German cities. And uh, our president, who is the mayor of Florence, has been very, very clear about that he said that cities can play an important part and that they you should seize this this opportunity because cities can persuade member states to assume you know to play a, a clear and less ambiguous uh, stance you know in uh, in this moment that could lead to a humanitarian emergency while cities are there with, with some pragmatism and some you know political willingness and committed leadership to to make sure that things go in a different way. So it's really good to see that Moving Cities uh, platform, the, the online plan platform that was launched, will contribute 
to amplify you know, the voice of cities and city networks as political actors in the European debate on migration. Now, now what I said is really, it's not only about, I mean, citizens' engagement uh, in this respect does not stop at the welcoming phase of course, but it's really more about the starting point for the integration and inclusion of migrants once they are arriving in cities. And that's why, you know, I just uh, very quickly would like to share with you the work we do uh, on citizen migration, migrant integration. And it builds basically on the Integrating Cities Charter. I don't know if uh, some of you know it. It's a charter that was launched many, many years ago, but it's still very valid. And that shows, you know, sort of uh, um, multiple and connected duties and responsibilities that European cities do play as, as in, in, their, in their different roles, you know, policymakers, service providers, employers, buyers of goods and services, all with the aim to provide, you know, equal opportunities for all residents, integrate migrants, embrace the diversity of, you know, the urban populations that, you know, is a reality in, in so many cities across Europe. And we also have a mutual learning program about innovative approaches and good practices, uh, you know, to make cities a welcoming place. Um, and, and again, make sure that cities can reflect the diversity of, uh, of local societies. But the point is also that um, cities need a lot, they do a lot of work. All this requires a lot of effort and work, and therefore it needs uh, a lot of resources. And that's why one of the main points of our advocacy, EU advocacy, but also national advocacy on migration and integration here at Eurocities, is really about a stronger involvement of cities in the accessibility and the management of EU funds. Uh, you know, specifically now also the involvement of cities by national governments in the drafting and the implementation and also the monitoring of national action plans uh, of EU funding programs for integration, like uh, AMIF, you know, the Asylum and Migration uh, Integration Fund, ESF, European Social Fund, and also the, the Structural Fund. And, and, and of course, this is important because we know that cities' budgets are tight, and this has become even more of an issue during, you know, following uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And, you know, uh, it, it's really, it's really difficult for cities that are on the first uh, line not to be able to count on those resources but wait for the national government um, to to you know send and trickle down the the resources and also it's really difficult to see when national governments uh, are reluctant to use the allocated new funding uh, to cities uh, because of political differences, for instance, between the national level and the local level and so on. So anyway, cities cannot afford to wait for this funding to trickle down and they have to do, they really have to do um, what they can. And so all, all, the, all the networks and initiatives and, and um, you know, projects that uh, could contribute to create basically a context for a multi-level governance at the European, national, local level on migration and integration policy making are very important because they will help to recognize that cities' leadership on migration integration is there, is clear, and needs to be supported. So, you know, just to conclude, I really, I really, we all love, uh, in Eurocities, really love this idea of moving cities because it really captures all these dimensions and, uh, it's really like uh, giving us, uh, you know, this idea of hope. So, yeah, that was my, my, my reflections, and I hope that that can be seen as a conclusion of, of the debate. Very much so, and thank you very much, Ms. Boni, for your uh, for your concluding remarks. I think you're uh, wrapping up quite nicely the discussions we had today from the introduction of our um, the introduction remarks we had this morning to the workshop discussions i i take um three i took three notes from what you you just said uh first uh you reminded us of the active role that cities have played in this in this field uh since 2015 but already way um second uh the the role that cities and the leadership that cities have taken on issues that have directly impacted their territories, but also beyond that, 
uh, which is taking initiative for the relocation of of uh, refugees and asylum seekers from Greece, and uh, and now we see with resettlement from Afghanistan. And uh, third point, uh, uh, and this is what a lot of speakers have said today, all of this is already happening. So it is possible. Um, it is happening, especially in regions where we hear another narrative of migration uh, that tends to dominate uh, the news and the political discussions. Uh, but, and I think this is uh, the message that uh, we probably will have to conclude with, uh, cities cannot wait, you said it. Um, and uh, you indicated some 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 ways to support cities further uh, with direct ac access to EU funding, direct access to uh, project uh, uh, proposal design and implementation. Uh, so there is a uh, there is work to do uh, for uh, those who joined the discussion today. May they be working for a city, civil society organization, or simply active uh, citizens of a city. Um, thank you very much for uh, your remarks on these very uh, interesting notes. I'd like to uh, close the meeting. I need to thank very much all the speakers and uh, the participants that joined the discussion. Thank you so much for taking the time to being with us today, um, as well as uh, many thanks to the organizers and uh, all the teams that stood behind uh, the scenes today. Uh, people at the Heinrich Böll Stiftung, the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, Seebrücke, uh, but also all the interpreters who uh, uh, enabled us to uh, talk to each other today, who made it possible for us to have conversations, uh, as well as the IT team uh, who uh, made it all possible despite the circumstances. Um, thank you all very much, and we hope to see you again soon. Um, stay healthy and have a good afternoon.